Imani, you write in your book that racism is often commonly thought of as belonging to the South. What do you mean by that? Well, I think generally when people talk about the South, they describe it as a place that is more racist. They reference the history of slavery and Jim Crow. And so, and in, in general, it sort of is the place that is considered the kind of bad place for lack of a more precise term when it comes to the relations of, of race. We have all those images in our mind, particularly of the civil rights struggle, and those have become sort of codified in the public. So do you think that the image of the South is misrepresented? Um, I think there's a misrepresentation in this sense. So often it is in some ways the projection of racial inequality and racism on the South allows other regions to absolve themselves of issues which are really national and even global. Racial inequality exists in every state in our union. Um, they may have sort of different variations of it, but it persists. And, and I also think the misrepresentation um, often, it, it, it is in part because, exists because we often forget that the majority of African Americans live in the South and always have. And so there are many people who are actually struggling against racism and racial inequality in the South and, and have for multiple generations. But here in New Jersey, we are in one of the most racially diverse states in the nation. People sometimes look at that and say, well, racism isn't our problem or isn't a problem here. Do you believe that that's misguided thinking? It is absolutely misguided to think racism isn't a problem in New Jersey. And, and part of that, um, I think failure to understand it has to do with people not remembering the history of New Jersey itself. New Jersey is distinct among states in the Northeast for having a much longer history of slavery. It has the, the last Gradual Emancipation Act in 1804, and there continue to be people born into slavery in that year. And then subsequently, really through the 1830s, there are people who are enslaved in some form or, or another in New Jersey. So the history of slavery is longer in New Jersey than other places in the region. And there was also a history of forms of Jim Crow. I mean, even segregation that James Baldwin described when he visited New Jersey and Princeton specifically um, in the mid 20th century. And we see the residues of that. There's persistent racial inequality. There's persistent segregation in New Jersey schools. And so it's a misunderstanding and that, that can often impede efforts to address inequality in the state. There is a lawsuit actually brought before the state of New Jersey right now uh, challenging that New Jersey schools remain some of the most segregated in the country. Do you see a difference in the way that race is dealt with, is discussed between the North and the South? You know, I would say that, I, that in all regions, people are having all kinds of important discussions about race. I think in the public arena, um, there are more open discussions about race often in northern states, but in any case, there's often a resistance to the kind of policy efforts that would really make these, these states equitable. And so one of the things I caution people is not to look, I mean, there's a lot to look at that's very concerning in southern states currently, from book banning to anti quote unquote CRT legislation and so forth. But it's also the case in other parts of the country, including New Jersey, that there are, each place has its own version of resistance to really having the difficult conversations and really having the political will to, to transform things. You have an interesting background where you were born in Alabama but grew up in Massachusetts. Just kind of put in focus for us um, the difference between those two regions in your mind. Well, so I, I'm so glad you asked that question because uh, one of the things that's important in my own experience is that I was born in Alabama in 1972. I moved to Massachusetts in the Boston area specifically right after it had one of the most horrible busing crises in the nation. So I moved to a place that was teeming with overt racism. And I was leaving a place that had really while certainly still unequal, had had a, very, a nationally and internationally recognized civil rights battle. So my experience as someone who came of age in the 70s and 80s was that Boston was actually more aggressively racist than Alabama. Um, and at the same time, there was this characterization of Massachusetts and Boston specifically as very liberal. 
And so it made me a person who was critical about how places were described and just tended to observe what was actually happening because the story and the truth didn't match up easily. What do you hope is the biggest takeaway from this book? Well, what I hope is that people will read it in an open way, will allow themselves to travel with me through the landscape, through history, through encounters with people and, and find themselves willing to reevaluate, to potentially be moved by the stories inside, by the characters who, who appear and actually take it with them as we try, they try to think about what is my role in this nation? What is my role in making this a fair and just and good place for everyone? And just in a couple seconds that we have left, you wrote the book Breathe as well. That's more or less a letter to your sons. Just describe your intention with that book. With Breathe, I wanted to take head on this description that I heard over and over again, that it must be so hard to raise black boys in this country. And I wanted instead for people to focus on the joy and the beauty and the importance of resilience, notwithstanding stereotype, notwithstanding inequality. Um, it was really important for me to make clear that all of our children are precious and, all, and the ability to raise them is always a gift, notwithstanding the difficulties. So beautifully said. Imani Perry, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.